Maybe you're a member of European royalty concerned about keeping power along family lines. Maybe you just live in Alabama. Either way, finding out why you can't and shouldn't marry your cousin is pretty important. Today, most people feel a sense of disgust at the thought of marrying within one's own family, and that's for good reason. History has taught us that keeping it all in the family is pretty much the worst thing you could do as far as future generations are concerned. Yet, for members of royalty throughout history, it was the preferred strategy for making sure that power and wealth always stayed within the family. The most famous of these, of course, would be the infamous Habsburgs, a powerful royal family of German-Austrian descent whose tangled web of power and shallow gene pool stretched across Middle Age Europe. In a bid to consolidate their hold on the various kingdoms of Europe, the Habsburgs engaged in the age-old tradition of strategic marriages. The only problem was that after a few centuries, so many Habsburgs were sitting on so many thrones that everyone else was edged out of the gene pool, lifeguards included. Unwilling to cede any of their vast fortune or political power to anyone outside the family, the Habsburgs regularly engaged in marrying within the family. Although the practice was mostly limited to cousins, still, this proved disastrous, and after several centuries, Habsburg family members were riddled with defects and illnesses. In Spain, the Habsburg's reign only lasted two centuries after King Charles II died at just 38 years old with no children. He had been born infertile and lived a sickly life until succumbing to disease. When, like the Habsburgs, you ritually used Ancestry.com instead of Tinder to find your next date, you're bound up to end with some serious birth defects. For Europe's most prominent royal family, this was most apparent with what was termed the Habsburg jaw, with individuals having pronouncedly sharp and jutting lower jaws, as well as a Beverly Hills gold digger with a midlife crisis and bad plastic surgery style bulbous lips and long noses. Along with those distinctively handsome looks, the Habsburgs also enjoyed rampant infertility and poor health, which directly led to their own downfall. Their illnesses and deformities were so severe that Charles II was affectionately known as El Hechizado, or the Bewitched, with peasants believing that surely he had been cursed by some evil witch or spirit. You could say that Charles enjoyed devilishly good looks, as in he looked like an actual devil. If the Catholic Church's inquisitors weren't busy burning women alive for wearing pants and doing math, they might have gone after poor Charles based on looks alone. Today, marrying your cousin is illegal in most places around the world though the law can differ depending on the familial distance between yourself and a cousin. In the US, 24 states ban marriage between first cousins, while 20 states allow it. The rest of the states allow cousin marriage with stipulations. For example, only if both are over the age of 50, 55, or 65, or if one or both members are infertile. The point of this government legislation on familial affairs is to limit the genetic harm passed on to potential offspring. But what exactly are the risks, and why do they exist? DNA is basically the operating system of the human body, no different than Windows for PC and Mac OS for Macs, or Linux for you edgelords out there. When you have a bad operating system though and copy it over to a new machine, you're basically installing the same bugs that that one computer is experiencing into a brand new one. Incest basically does the same thing with DNA. The point of intermingling our DNA is so that others can make up for the genetic shortfalls we ourselves have. If, for instance, you have a defective gene which makes you susceptible to a specific disease, then your offspring will inherit your bad gene along with a potentially healthy gene from another partner. Then the healthy gene will help protect your child from the effects of the disease you yourself are vulnerable to. The same goes for preventing genetic abnormalities and physical defects. Good DNA from a suitable partner can help make up for your trash dollar store DNA, and thus as the child develops good genetic instructions are copied from your partner's DNA in all the places that your DNA sucks. Let's help make this a little more visual for you guys though. One day, Billy brings home Wendy, the hottest girl at the party he was just at. Problem is, that party was a family reunion. Billy and Wendy fall in love and get married, and soon after, Wendy gets pregnant. As their DNA combines and their child begins to grow into an embryo, it turns out that both Billy and Wendy have the exact same bad sequence of DNA. A bit of bad genetic code that makes both Billy and Wendy think that T-Mobile is a superior cellular telephone service provider, when in fact the entire company is a burning dumpster fire. With the exact same piece of bad code on both sets of DNA, Billy and Wendy's child is doomed to inherit that same genetic flaw and end up paying for inferior cellular telephone service for the rest of his life. Let's rewind time a bit though. This time, Billy decides to leave his home state of Alabama and stop attending those family reunion slash singles mixers. During his trip abroad, he meets a new girl, Cindy, and the two quickly fall in love. Shortly after marriage, Cindy becomes pregnant and once more two sets of DNA combine in the great miracle of life. Billy's DNA is garbage, we already know that. 
But luckily, that same genetic sequence that makes Billy choose the worst cell company as his provider is different for Cindy. Instead, Cindy's healthy DNA realizes that T-Mobile is the year of 2020 of cell phone companies, and as Billy and Cindy's child develops, she will inherit genes from her mother, and while she'll likely still carry Billy's bad DNA, she has much lower risk of passing it on to future generations. With parents and siblings sharing 50% of DNA, the possibility of passing on bad genes is significant, and a good reason for not having a crush on your classmates when you're homeschooled. As you start looking at other branches of the family tree, the odds improve significantly though. First cousins only share 12.5% of the same DNA, second cousins share 6.25% of the DNA, and third cousins share just over 3%. It's only when you get to the seventh cousins, which is the average familial separation between American couples, that there basically is no genetic relation anymore. 12.5% though isn't bad odds, so what's terrible about marrying a cousin? Well, you could ask any XCOM player who's ever taken a shot with 87.5% chance of success, only to see the character completely miss said shot over and over and over again. The problem is that at such levels of familiarity in the gene pool, cousins could be passing on a 4-7% to risk of genetic disease versus 3-4% to for the rest of us. That may not seem like a big deal, but that's just for a single disease. And there are thousands of potential time bombs ticking in your trash tier DNA. When you roll the dice that many times, a 3 percentage point spread leads to significantly different results, and for the kid you had with your cousin a whole slew of potential diseases or defects. Today there isn't much risk of marrying a cousin and making your very own goonie sloth. Our modern society affords us a highly mobile lifestyle that presents us with a dizzying array of varying gene pools. Compare that to the mid-1800s, when people were expected to live and die in the same town they were born in and ended up marrying someone within a 6 mile radius of their home. With such limited opportunities to meet new potential partners, it's no surprise then that marriages between first cousins were extremely popular for most of human history. For a majority of places in the world, that's a worry of the past, except for Iceland, where most of the population lives in the capital of Reykjavik. There's so much concern over accidentally marrying into your own family there that the most popular dating app isn't Tinder, it's Icelandica app which makes sure that whoever you've got the hots for hasn't been attending the same family reunions you have. Hey, we know we've been pretty rough on Alabama this episode, it's all in good humor. Like one of our favorite comedians Jeff Foxworthy said, you guys train NASA astronauts there after all, they just don't let you fly any of the rockets. For more reasons why you should be fishing outside of your own gene pool, watch When Royal Inbreeding Went Horribly Wrong, or check out this other video instead.